are fortunate to be able to use other media platforms. Firstly, it is my great pleasure to welcome Rabbi Baroness Julia Neuberger, who is to speak on the subject, Why Antisemitism Matters, which I'm sure we shall all find very thought-provoking. It is wonderful to have her here with us today. Also welcome to Rabbi Richard and Rabbi Margaret Jacobi, and to members and non-members of Southgate Progressive Synagogue who have joined our Zoom or are watching on other outlets. I now invite Richard, Rabbi Richard Jacobi to give the opening prayer. Thank you, Pearl. We are gathering here on the Sunday after what would have been Dad's 96th birthday. Had he lived, a third bar mitzvah would have been in order. His first bar mitzvah was at the Frieden's Temple in Berlin, the last before Kristallnacht in 1938. The money given to him in celebration, 64 Reichsmark, became part of the reparations claimed by Hitler's government. One of Dad's small but important victories as a rabbi was to ensure that the Pesach prayer of the 1944 Jewish inmates of Bergen-Belsen camp was retained in liberal Judaism's Haggadah B'chol Dor Vador. It was a prayer written at a time when anti-Jewish hatred reached its absolute lowest ebb. We recite it in our Seder to connect the exodus from Egypt with the survival of Judaism and the Jewish people after that period of Shoah. While we might pray that such times do not recur, it is also our duty to do all that we can to prevent the possibility of such genocide against Jews or any other group of people. So I wish to read this prayer as we open our proceedings now, as it links Dad, our speaker's theme, and our responsibility to the world and all its people. Our Father in heaven, Behold, it is evident and known to thee that it is our desire to do thy will and to celebrate the festival of Passover by eating matzah and by observing the prohibition of chametz. But our heart is pained that the enslavement prevents us and we are in danger of our lives. Behold, we are prepared and ready to fulfill thy commandment and you shall live by them and not die by them. Therefore our prayer to thee is that thou mayest keep us alive and preserve us and redeem us speedily so that we may observe thy statutes and do thy will and serve thee with a perfect heart. And let us say, Amen. My father would undoubtedly be delighted to know that his long-standing friend and colleague, Julia Neuberger, is the second deliverer of the Harry Martin Jacobi Memorial Lecture. To suggest that Julia has re retired is as ludicrous a suggestion as to say that she is retiring. Rabbi Baroness Julia Neuberger is a working peer and I believe, I meant to check this with you, the first rabbi other than a retired chief rabbi of the United Synagogue to serve in the house. She is also currently the chair of two NHS trust boards as well as chairing Independent Age, 
and serving as a commissioner on the UK Commission on Bereavement. Born Julia Schwab. Julia studied at Newnham College, Cambridge, before receiving ordination in 1977 from Leyerbeck College. As many of you will know, Julia had her doubts about becoming a rabbi and was only convinced when someone told her she couldn't possibly do it. She was the second woman to re receive ordination from Leyerbeck College and the first to serve a congregation on her own, which she did at South London Liberal Synagogue from 1977 to 1989. And in the two decades following ordination, she also taught at Leyerbeck College. I benefited from her scholarship then. She was Chancellor at the University of Ulster from 1999 to 2000. She served as Chief Executive of the King's Fund, a think tank focused especially on health issues. And she served there from 1997 to 2004. As a working Liberal Democrat peer from 2004 to 2011, she was active on the Science and Technology Committee, where she helped to draft the bill regulating the use of human tissue and embryos in 2008. She was also the Prime Minister's champion of volunteering from 2007 to 2009. Julia was the president of our movement, Liberal Judaism, until spring 2011, when she joined West London Synagogue as its senior rabbi from which role she retired in 2020, being made Rabbi Emerita. While at West London, she also headed the review of the Liverpool Care Pathway for Dying Patients from 2013 to 2015. And throughout her career, she has served on other charities or organisations as a board member or trustee. Julia is also a respected author, with titles including On Being Jewish, The Moral State We're In, and most recently and relevantly to this afternoon, Anti-Semitism, What It Is, What It Isn't, and Why It Matters. Having mentioned the book, it's approaching the time for me to stop and to encourage Julia to start, as I am very much looking forward with all of you to hearing her thoughts on this subject, and especially, in my case, about the reluctance of various authorities to take it seriously. Now, a quick word to our audience. Whichever way you are enjoying this afternoon, please would you, if you have questions as Julia is speaking, Write those questions onto chat if you're in Zoom via the social media you are using to watch the and listen to the lecture. Or if you are in the building here, Sue Jessel has slips of paper and pen that she will come round with so that you can send the questions by whatever means into us here so that Rabbi Yuval Keren can then collate the questions and we'll ask those questions on everyone's behalf. We do apologize now. It's likely that we won't be able to take every question, but we will do our best to be fair to people on all the platforms to give them their voice and to hear as many questions as you can. So all that said, Rabbi Baroness Julia Neuberger, please give us the benefit of your experience and your wisdom this afternoon. Well, thank you, Richard. And um, well, I'm not sure about the wisdom and experience, but let me have a, oh, the specs are worse than no specs. Um, let me have a go at talking about this subject. So as Richard said, I uh, wrote a book about this really like, because like so many of you, I was so angry about anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. And I want to start with that because Harry and I talked about that. 
And he was furious, but he was much nicer than me. He was a much nicer person. Very gentle character. He wasn't like me. So, so, I mean, what was so interesting was Harry campaigning. And it was incredibly moving. And you've just seen the, uh, the, the UNICEF uh, piece that he did. And you've probably also seen the piece that he did with Alf Dubs. Harry always did it in a gentle but firm way. I would tend to get much more excited. We made quite a good double act, actually. So um, he and I talked about this a lot. And we particularly talked about this from about the year 2000 onwards. And so I'm very, very touched to have been asked to give the second Harry Jacobi Memorial Lecture. I was absolutely devoted to him. I was really pleased and honored to be asked to come and see him just before he died. That was one of the most moving moments. Um, I think, I mean, I've never been completely sure, I know he knew both my grandmother and my father, and I think he knew my grandmother because I suspect, but we need to dig that out, I think, Margaret and, and Richard, um, I suspect that it was my grandmother who was responsible for sorting out the accommodation in Manchester when he arrived. My grandmother chaired the Welfare Committee of the Refugee Committee. And when Harry came to our house, he saw, we have an oil painting by Rose Henriquez of my grandmother sitting at her desk at Bloomsbury House, chairing the Welfare Committee of the Refugee Committee. And I remember him saying he remembered her looking like that. So I, th th I think it must be of that period, but I don't know, I mean, I just don't know exactly when, and he never did tell me exactly when. So there, there you go. Anyway, um, it's a great honor to be asked to give this lecture. Um, Harry and I talked quite a lot about his childhood, about his experiences. I'm also the child of a, a German refugee. My mother was a refugee, but she was older. She came as, an, as a young adult, she was 22. Um, but there was a lot in common. And so when we were colleagues, although he was much senior to me and I really looked up to him, um, it was really wonderful talking about some of those refugee issues together. And particularly as the issue of child migrants came to the fore politically in this country with Alf Dubs and others, it was wonderful to be able to work uh, with Harry and to introduce at one point Harry and Alf and get Harry to tell Alf he had to come to my synagogue to speak on a Friday night. And Alf said, well, I'm not really Jewish, to which Harry's response was, as far as I can tell, so what? Uh, it was a wonderful sort of Harry-ish, well, you are really, um, moment. I mean, Harry's view was rather like mine. Most people are Jewish. It just depends how far back you look. Um, anyway, it was, a, it was one, one of the great moments of being with Harry. But I think it's important to say that Harry and I, from 2000 onwards, had quite a lot of conversations about what we saw as the rising anti-Semitism in Britain. And um, somewhat to his disquiet's not right, but I became a board member of the Community Security Trust, CSP, which Harry sometimes thought took a rather extreme view which I rather agreed with, actually, and I thought I was there as a moderating force, obviously not successful enough. And, um, but after about 2014, Harry said, well, maybe both he and I had got that wrong, and maybe CST had got it right, that the monitoring of anti-Semitic, both verbal and physical attacks, was something that was increasingly necessary. At that point, it was still really looking at Europe, rather than at Britain. And of course, from 2016, it became an issue in Britain as well. So that's really the starting point, and it was something that Harry and I discussed. And I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get to the end of what I want to say, so I might skip chunks, if which, in which case I apologize. And this isn't a rehash of the book, because most of this is more recent. Um, so, but let me start with the Corbyn years, because I think that's when most of us in the UK became really disturbed. We'd seen the stuff in Paris. Uh, I remember, you know, when there was the uh, first the Charlie Hebdo and then the uh, Hyper Cacher uh, stuff in, in Paris. I remember at West London Synagogue, we had every French Jew in the capital suddenly came to Friday night, like, you know, they've never been to synagogue for the last 50 years, but still. And it was, you, I remember that, but it felt like it was there and not here. And then it changed. And so 
I think it would be fair to say both Harry and I were really disturbed by the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe from around 2000 onwards. And then, of course, from 2016, what happened during the Corbyn years. And I think, like many of you, I was asked time and again whether there genuinely was and is anti-Semitism in the British Labour Party. Does that sound familiar? Uh, and whether, and of course, this is critical, if you don't want to be thought of as anti-Semitic, you can never criticise the actions of the State of Israel. And a lot of us felt really uncomfortable with this uh, because we saw this as rising anti-Semitism and a sort of breach of trust between the nation as a whole and its Jewish population. And, and we are a Jewish population. I mean, you know, Margaret and Richard and I may be the children of asylum seekers, of refugees, but this community has been here for over 350 years uninterrupted, which is not something you can say of most of Europe. So we're a very old Jewish community, a very accepted Jewish community, a Jewish community, you know, people sort of recite, thank you, Richard, all my ridiculous titles. But actually, if you look back into the 17th century and early 18th century, there were loads of Jews with, you know, Solomon de Medina and Samson Gideon with titles then. This isn't new. Jews being part of the British establishment goes back well over 200 years. So I think we felt a breach of trust. And I think that's really important. And I think that's why, given the levels of anti-Semitism in this country, relatively low, say, compared with France, why we get so worried about it. And that's, of course, got less since Keir Starmer took over as leader of the Labour Party. <coughs> and it's really important to stress that he's done a huge amount to root out the worst of the anti-Semites. I mean, you know, all credit to him, because I can tell you it's not easy. The hard left are vile. But it isn't necessarily enough, and he knows that. And some of those attitudes which, uh, you know, used only to be found on the far left or the far right, have actually become a part of regular discourse, and particularly on social media, and certainly within universities, and to some extent they're spreading. And I think that's the bit that really we ought to take seriously, because I think the whole question about social media and what's going on in universities is really, is really, really serious. So I'm going to take some examples. So the first one is Sally Rooney. Now, you know, there's been, the Jewish community have got up in arms about Sally Rooney. I mean, I think it's a publicity stunt myself. But she got herself um, into the center of a controversy, refusing to allow her new book to be translated into Hebrew by an Israeli company, Modan. And she said it was in support of calls to boycott Israel over its policies towards the Palestinians. And she said it would be an honor to have Beautiful World, Where Are You, translated into Hebrew by a company which shared her political views. And senior Israeli minister, what a surprise, said such boycotts were a form of anti-Semitism. Now, she actually issued a statement clarifying her action. I think this is really important after being accused of refusing to allow her novel to be translated into Hebrew at all. And it all came after it, you know, she turned down this thing. And she said she was very proud that her two previous novels, Conversations with Friends and Normal People, had been translated into Hebrew. And then she just, here's a quote, for the moment I've chosen not to sell these translation rights to an Israeli-based publishing house. And she cited a recent report by Human Rights Watch accusing Israel of practicing apartheid. And she just said it was in support of BDS. And she couldn't uh, accept, I'm quoting, a new contract with an Israeli company that does not publicly distance itself from apartheid and support the UN stipulated rights of the Palestinian people. And then she continued, the Hebrew language translation rights to my new novel are still available. And if I can find a way to sell these rights that's compliant with the BDS's movement institutional boycott guidelines, I'll be very pleased and proud to do so. So Israel obviously is saying that BDS opposes the country's very existence and is motivated by anti-Semitism, and it uh, calls the Human Rights Watch preposterous and false. I'm not going to get into the rights and wrongs of the Human Rights Watch stuff. I will say, however, that criticizing Israel is not necessarily anti-Semitic. Anyway, she got praise and blame in roughly equal measures. If you look on social media, which is something that I never used to do, and I still don't have a Facebook or Twitter account, but I do spend a lot of my time looking at this stuff. 
And my favourite quote is from Tracy Ann Oberman, one of my great heroines, and I'm proud to call her a friend. And she writes to the Kurds. Does everybody know who Tracy Ann Oberman is, the actress? OK. So she writes to the Kurds. Dear Kurdish friends, one day, forgive my language, by the way, I'm quoting Tracy Ann, not me. One day, BDS and Sally Rooney will give a shit about you too. Similarly, gay friends in Russia. One day, Brian Eno will care about you too. Selective boycotting of arts is questionable. At Prulis, your mother, who fought so hard against apartheid, agreed. BDS is a racist organization because it seeks to eradicate the world's only Jewish state. Cultural boycotts do nothing for peace and reconciliation. In fact, the opposite. And I think that it's perfectly right to say that Sally Rooney was doing a bit of virtue signaling on social media that actually also enabled her to sell more books. And I do think the question that needs to be posed to her, and if I ever get a chance, I will do so, is is she doing the same about Chinese rights? That's a state publisher that she's got. Saudi, Turkey, Russia. If not, what is this about? But let us realize that despite the fuss, this is actually quite small. Let's look at something that really does matter. Let's talk about social media itself. First of all, what happens with social media? Because I think it's really important we think about it. It's not like normal debate. When I shut up, you will all get a chance to pose questions at, to me, and I will have to answer them. Now, I may not answer them properly, and you may think you haven't got an answer, but it is a normal debate, and it's, it's an exchange. The thing about social media is it's like an echo chamber. You tend to have people in your social media group with whom you already agree. So you say something and somebody else agrees with it, who agrees with it, and it gets moved, passed on and passed on. And you're already living in a society where opinion counts as much as fact. And that's why this is so dreadful. And I think you have to say, although Sally Rooney doesn't matter, Virtue signalling does matter if being anti-Zionist is the new badge of virtue for the left and maybe increasingly the centre-left in this country. And it is a real example of context here because Sally Rooney's stand would arguably be legitimised if she forbade translations into Arabic, Turkish, Chinese, Hungarian, Russian and various other languages we could all think of where the governments commit far worse things than the Israeli authorities. And some of the broadsheet newspapers in this country have actually fairly made that point. They could make it more strongly, apart from the Times, but they have made it, the Times has done well. But apart from that, you know, it's not a big deal. So I think the first thing we have to say to ourselves is, does signalling out of Israel matter? To which I think the answer has to be yes. And does Sally Rooney matter? Probably not. And I think we should move on. Let me move on then to the universities, where I think it's much more serious, much, much more serious. Does the government's wish to control the universities and its much, um, much vaunted online harms bill really help? Does saying that universities need to be a place of free speech rather than woke, does that help? Does stopping the universities uh, no platforming people who represent Israel or people who argue that there is a difference between transgender people and people who were born either male or female? I pose the question, I don't know the answer. But let me give you some examples. I'm going to give you the example of David Miller. He's been in the news a lot recently. He is truly ghastly. So he was professor of sociology at Bristol from 2018, so a very recent appointment actually at Bristol till he was sacked this month. He's the co-founder and co-director of a non-profit company, Public Interest Investigations, which has got two main projects, Spinwatch, a website which says that it's devoted to public interest reporting on spin lobbying and political corruption, and Powerbase, a wiki that monitors power networks and conflicts of interest. Spinwatch aligns with Miller's interest in, and I quote, concentrations of power in society by examining networks which, you, which use spin and deception to distort public debate and undermine democracy. 
In the New Statesman earlier this year, Dave Rich, who some of you will know, who's head of policy at the Community Security Trust, another person I'm proud to call a friend, wrote that Spinwatch, I quote, echoes certain facets of anti-Semitic conspiracism. Miller's work, according to Rich, attempts to identify pro-Israel trusts and foundations and networks of money or power, which Miller believes are attempting to marginalize British Muslims. Miller, Rich argued, refers to a handful of donors who have given money to two think tanks that Miller deemed to be Islamophobic. However, it's unclear what evidence he had that they gave their money specifically to fund research on Muslim-related issues, or that they formed a coordinated network that acted together. You'll all remember this. In 2019, Jewish students and Bristol's Jewish Society made a complaint to Bristol University. Students said that they felt, taken as a whole, his lecture series, The Harms of the Powerful, was reminiscent of, and again I quote, anti-Semitic language, tropes, and conspiracy theories. Miller said, I don't teach conspiracy theories of any sort, and that it is simply a matter of fact that parts of the Zionist movement, what's that by the way, are involved in uh, funding Islamophobia. The complaint was rejected by the university on the basis that it did not contain any material that was hostile to Jews and therefore could not be considered anti-Semitic. They were incredibly slow to act. That's answering your point, Richard. You know, what is it that makes authorities slow to act? They were very slow to act because on the 20th of May last year, Miller was suspended as a member of the Labour Party and he resigned the following month after accusing Keir Starmer of taking money from the Zionist movement. The following month, he said, that the targeted harassment of him and other socialist members confirmed, I quote, the degree of influence that Zionist advocates and lobbyists for Israel have over disciplinary processes and party policy. In an online public forum on the 29th of July last year, Miller said, the Zionist movement and the Israeli government are the enemy of the left, the enemy of world peace, and they must be directly targeted. And in an online public forum on the 13th of February this year, Miller singled out a specific member of the Bristol University student body as a Zionist, and that student was subsequently the target of anti-Semitic abuse. Now, Bristol still had done nothing. The all-party parliamentary group against anti-Semitism accused Miller of inciting hatred against Jewish students, and that was in early March 2021. The Times, at the same time, reported Miller had been accused of anti-Semitism. He'd called for the end of Zionism, and he'd said that Israel, I quote, is trying to exert its will all over the world. He called members of the University of Bristol Jewish Society pawns of a violent, racist foreign regime engaged in ethnic cleansing. In a letter to Bristol University, Marie van der Zyl, president of the Board of Deputies, said Miller's increasingly hysterical attacks on British Jewish organizations are now raising the prospect of real physical harm. In a statement, Bristol University said it did not endorse the comments made by Professor David Miller about our Jewish students, and also said, ever heard of free speech? Equally, we must balance the rights and often wide-ranging views of students and staff with institutional policies and national law concerning academic freedom and freedom of speech. A few days later, Danny Finkelstein, columnist in The Times and also a member of the House of Lords, wrote, I quote, Waywardness has a place in academic life, and he was sceptical of the cancel culture. The issue that convinced Danny Finkelstein, that Miller should be removed from his post, was his, and I quote, attack on the Bristol University Jewish Society, proper actual students at his own university, as being part of a coordinated campaign of censorship directed by the State of Israel. Miller had previously told the Jewish Chronicle that there is a real question of abuse here, of Jewish students on British campuses being used as political pawns by a violent, racist foreign regime engaged in ethnic cleansing. We've heard him say this before. On the 17th of March this year, the university said that it had begun an investigation of Miller. 
Later in March, Avon and Somerset Police said that they'd opened a hate crime investigation. In April 2021, so this year, 550 academics, including Simon Sharma and Simon Seabag Montefiore, signed a letter condemning Miller's statements the previous February. Thangam Debonair, the local, uh, the local MP, also denounced Miller's comments. But an open letter to the university was signed by hundreds of public intellectuals and academics, including high-profile names who are also Jewish, such as Noam Chomsky. And this is what they said. Professor Miller is an eminent scholar. He's known internationally for exposing the role that powerful actors and well-resourced coordinated networks play in manipulating and stage managing public debates, including on racism. Now you'll all know that the University of Bristol terminated David Miller's employment with immediate effect on the 1st of October this month. Miller, and I quote, did not meet the standards of behavior we expect from our staff. The university disciplinary hearing included a third party investigation by a QC who found that Miller's comments did not constitute unlawful speech. Now, the precise reasons for the university's conclusion are confidential, but The Guardian reported that they understood not to cover the content of his lectures. The university statement that, uh, the, the, um, that cited its duty of care to all students and the wider university community and observe the need to apply its own codes of conduct seems to be the core of it. So in other words, it was his attack on specific Jewish students within the university. At the time Miller's sacking was announced, the university faced legal action by the campaign against anti-Semitism. Uh, the campaign said the university had both breached its duty of care to its students and that in addition, it was liable in its own right for unlawful conduct in breach of the Equality Act. The CAA said that its case against the University of Bristol, pre-action proceedings for which had already begun, centered on Miller's comments that Zionism is the enemy of world peace and that Zionists, including members of the Jewish Student Union at Bristol University, must be directly targeted. And in response, Miller, of course, and predictably said, the university has embarrassed itself and the entire British academic sector by capitulating to a pressure campaign. Da, 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 da. Can he say what he likes? Is the campaign against anti-Semitism right? And is the real issue, which I suspect it is, and the university was slow to act, the targeting of individuals and arguing for direct action against students on his own campus, including people that he very possibly taught? He'd finally got fired, but Bristol dragged its feet. Is that okay? And of course, since then, he hasn't shut up and he's gone in about, you know, the Labour Party being effectively a prisoner of the Zionist movement and the Israeli state, da, 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 da. It's the hard left. We know it's the hard left. And he's made that very clear because he's been doing some work with uh, an organisation called LCFFS, which is a new campaign in, within Labour uh, to refuse anti-Semitism training provided by the Jewish Labour movement. So we know where it is. Yeah, but what's significant is at precisely this same time, there was a case at the University of Essex and they behaved completely differently. So in February 2019, more than 200 students at Essex voted against the establishment of a Jewish society and a lecturer, Maruf Ali, was suspended for allegedly posting anti-Semitic material on Facebook. One, in relation to the proposed establishment of the Jewish Student Society, placed on a page for first year students, allegedly claimed that Zionists next want to create a society here at our university. Other posts he allegedly made included Holocaust denial, comparison of Israel to Nazi Germany, and an image shared from the Nazi apologist site Smoloko claiming that French policeman Ahmed Merabet, murdered in the terrorist attack on the Charlie Hebdo offices in Paris, was a crypto Jew, and that he was a Mossad agent who was alive and in hiding. And in an interview, Maruf Ali said, I'm not sure if I can find another job in the UK, let alone an academic job. 
I could only be employed by someone who is willing to stand up to Zionist bullying, at bullying and intimidation. A proposal for the establishment of a Jewish society for students at the University of Essex was published on the University Student Union website in February 2019. So, you know that 200 students voted against, following advice from a University Amnesty Society member, uh, and which, which said, the society has mentioned it will celebrate Israel National Day, with has nothing, which has nothing to do with Judaism. Until the society is politically neutral, like every other religious society, we will take a stance on this. So we urge you to please vote no until they are politically neutral. About 600 students voted on the ratification of the society, so about 64% in favour. Now, how different from Bristol? The university's vice chancellor, Professor Anthony Forster, not Jewish, intervened, stating that the society would be created irrespective of any ratification. And he also announced the launch of a review to ensure we provide unequivocal support to our Jewish students and staff. Amnesty International, interestingly, subsequently distanced itself from the university's Amnesty Society members who had advised on the vote, stating that their remarks do not reflect the view of Essex University Amnesty Society and Amnesty International. The university held a rally in its main square in February of 2019 in solidarity with the Jewish community. Everybody went. And the university's vice chancellor said, leading the rally, today we've come together to show anti-Semitism is completely antithetical to the values of the University of Essex, and it has absolutely no place on our campuses and in our relationships with each other. The university appointed an independent external group to advise on the process and outcomes and approve the report. I was part of that group. Uh, it was absolutely brilliant. And it had one of the pro-vice chancellors in charge of that, Professor Jules Pretty, who was be above and beyond fair-minded. It's really important, I think, that we have plenty of non-Jews who understand and are sympathetic. And Jules Pretty and Anthony Forster, you know, come at the forefront of that list in my mind. And the group's members said that they hoped the review would provide guidance for dealing not just with anti-Semitism, but any form of discrimination. And they said that the in-depth review of the experiences of Jewish students and staff encapsulates best practice in addressing anti-Semitism. The group said that the university had taken swift action to deal with concerns and undertake the review, and added, we consider that this report represents a model of the response that an institution such as a university should make to allegations of or concerns about anti-Semitism or any other form of discrimination. We urge other universities to learn from the spirit, actions, and content of this investigation, whether in regard to Jewish concerns or those of any other group. And then the recommendations proceeded. And Essex does not have a problem with anti-Semitism. And they took action quickly. They nipped it in the bud. And what they did was they called on all decent-minded people to sort of stand up and say, this isn't okay. A bit like the demonstration that some of you will remember in Parliament Square, where it was largely Jews standing up saying, Dayenu, enough is enough. But actually, when I went there, I went with 50 or so colleagues from the House of Lords, mostly Labour, and I think only one other was Jewish. Everybody else was not Jewish. They were just appalled. And actually, I think that's really important. I think if you want the authorities to take this seriously, this has to be not only a Jewish issue. It has to be something that other people think is serious enough to take a view and to take some action. And I think that's what has been so difficult. I don't want to talk, I'm going to talk for about another 10 minutes, 15 minutes, that'll be it, and then you get a chance to have a go at me. But before that, let me just say a bit about Jeremy Corbyn, and I'm not going to say it goes through all of that because most of you will know. But there was all the stuff about uh, Ken Livingstone and not kicking Ken Livingstone out and Jerry me Corbyn being an apologist for him and, you know, and John Mann being called in by Jeremy Corbyn uh, because uh, he'd called Livingstone a disgusting Nazi apologist, you know, all of that. And 
you know, the Labour Party was in real trouble over anti-Semitism, and they dragged their feet over the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. We probably all feel it could be improved in some ways. You know, if we all had a go at editing it, it would look a bit different probably, but that's not the point. It's been generally accepted, and whether we think it's perfect or not is not the point. The point is that the Labour Party, after all its trouble over anti-Semitism, ought to have accepted it quickly. And of course, they didn't. And I think it's really important to understand that they didn't. And Keir Starmer, of course, made it very clear that he absolutely felt that they should, and indeed they did. And Jonathan Friedland wrote about this, and I'm going to quote it because I think it's so, so important. He wrote, on the left, black people are usually allowed to define what's racism. Women can define sexism. Muslims are, just, are trusted to define Islamophobia. But when Jews call out something as anti-Semitic, leftist non-Jews feel curiously entitled to tell Jews that they're wrong, that they're exaggerating or lying or using it as a decoy tactic, and then to treat them to a long lecture on what anti-Jewish racism really is. The left would call it misogynist mansplaining if a man talked that way to a woman. They'd be mortified if they were caught doing that to LGBT people or to Muslims. But to Jews, they feel no such restraint. So this is my plea to the left. Treat us the same way you treat any other minority, no better and no worse. If opposition to racism means anything, it surely means that. And then you may remember the inquiry into antisemitism in the Labour Party, which was chaired by Shami Chakrabarti, now Baroness Chakrabarti, who found that the party was not overrun by anti-Semitism, which certainly the, uh, particularly the women Jewish Labour MPs would have found rather eccentric. And many people found that report inadequate. Um, and it was particularly inadequate because it didn't tackle the student issue. And I don't know whether you remember this, but it's just worth raising. It was a particular issue about the Oxford University Labour Club. And Alex Chalmers, the chairman, resigned publicly in 2016 because he cited members of the Labour Club executive throwing around the term Zio, which is a derogatory term, um, and with casual abandon and expressing their solidarity with Hamas and explicitly defending their tactics of indiscriminately murdering civilians. Now, the deputy chair of the inquiry into anti-Semitism in the Labour Club was, um, was somebody called Jan Royal, who was leader of Labour in the House of Lords. She's a very good friend of mine. She's now principal of Somerville College, Oxford. And she did, that, she did that bit of the inquiry. She did the inquiry into what was going on at Oxford. And she found strongly against them. She didn't think it was institutional anti-Semitism, but she was very, very critical of them. And Labour chose not to publish that bit of the report. And so Jan Royal published that bit of the report independently herself because she was so, so shocked. And that was very typical. So there were the authorities that had a commission to look at anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. But when a bit of it about the Labour Club at Oxford came out as really strongly critical, they decided not to publish it. So Jeremy Corbyn really was in trouble. He eventually had to agree, because they were in such trouble, that um, they would sign the IRA, IHRA. But they had added, as people will remember, an, an accompanying statement agreed by the National Executive Committee aimed at protecting free speech about Israel and the rights of Palestinians. God forbid they should just have accepted it. And they also went along with, there's not a, a direct link, I can't say to you, you can prove that this is the Labour left. But they certainly didn't condemn the name calling of quite a lot of people. And the person I'm going to cite in particular is Margaret Hodge, the veteran MP, who is very funny about this. I don't know whether people have had any encounter with her recently, but uh, Margaret Hodge on the subject of, you know, my family tried to make me Jewish. The rabbis tried to make me Jewish. My friends tried to make me Jewish. My sisters tried to make me Jewish. Jeremy Corbyn, he made me Jewish. <laughs> and she really had a go at him. And she told him he was an effing anti-Semite, quite rightly. And uh, she really laid into Jeremy Corbyn. And she had disciplinary proceedings launched against her in 2018 
because she had actually confronted him. And what she said was, he's now perceived by many as an anti-Semite. I chose to confront Jeremy directly and personally to expect, express my anger and outrage. I stand, stand by my action as well as my words. My grandmother and my uncle were murdered by Hitler and many cousins were slaughtered in the gas chambers. I joined the Labour Party to fight racism, to find myself 50 years later confronting anti-Semitism in my own party is completely and utterly awful. Now, Margaret Hodge wasn't alone. Ruth Smees has had a terrible time. Luciana Burge has had a terrible time. Maureen Littman's had a terrible time. I could add more and more. The Metropolitan Police have got a case file on it, and some of the Labour Party officials were party to it, and this is completely appalling. But a lot of this took place on social media. And the question that I want to put to you and it's one of the ones perhaps we can discuss, is what do the controls on social media need to be? I'm, I'm an old bleeding heart liberal. I grew up in the Labour Party. My mum was a communist as well as Jewish in Germany before the war, that was a bit careless. And I, you know, I come from a left of center, free speech defending, anti-censorship, liberal view of the world. And I now think that we have to impose some quite strict controls on social media. My husband would disagree. He says that if you do that, all that you'll do is put it underground. It'll just go underground. It'll go, it'll go into the dark web. Well, that may be so, but it's harder to get at. So you don't get quite such an effective echo chamber. But I think you, we were going to have to do something because if you look on Twitter any day, and I try and avoid it, but mostly I have to because of the work I'm doing, and you'll find neat poison repeated and repeated and repeated until people think it's true. And tie that together with the cancel culture, and you have a curious society in which virulent anti-Semitism is okay, but calling it out leads to a call for the caller out to be cancelled. That's bizarre. And if you don't believe me, Look at what the non-Jewish actor, Eddie Marson, from Wrigley Road has been saying as a result of his experience of playing a Jew. I'm not going to say the word, F me, this is relentless. All I did was play a Jew. I dread to think what would have happened if I was actually Jewish. And then amongst various arguments and examples that he flagged was a tweet from a user who had said, he would never watch shite with your apartheid loving bake in it. And in fact, you may remember, because one of the EastEnders actors, uh, Gary Webster, then waded in. Do people see this? Because like, it's one of the things that cheers me up. It's the, it's the, it's the non-Jews in support that I love, saying, don't let them grind you down. You're an exceptional actor and a top person. Enough said. We need, we need regulation. I never thought I'd say it. A couple of other things. Just to remind you of the mere one mural. Does everybody remember about the mere one mural? where Jeremy Corbyn defended it on the grounds of free speech and the somewhat strange Muslim mayor of Tower Hamlets asked for, it, asked for it to be taken down straight away, look for Rahman, great man. Anyway, you know, Jeremy Corbyn tied himself in knots because he said it, on free speech grounds it ought to stay. Then it emerged that he hadn't actually looked at it. Then he looked at it and said on free speech grounds it ought to stay. And then finally, having been, you know, had this batted back and forth, Luciana Berger and others did force him into the position of saying that it was really disgraceful and it ought to come down. But it was only, by, it was only then that, you know, he finally agreed. And a lot of it was, he kept on coming back to saying this was all about weaponizing. This was all, you know, it's, it's about a minority uh, who, that was and to some extent remains insecure, that's us, and it's not about us weaponizing all this material as opposition to Jeremy Corbyn. It's Jeremy Corbyn not understanding, as leader of a major political party, that you need to be careful about what you say. You might say you might be careful about what you think as well. Okay, something I just want to reflect on briefly. The authorities, in this case, the authorities in the Labour Party were incredibly slow to act, and that's partly because the main people were, in fact, Corbyn supporters, Corbyn appointees. And one of the things that's happened since there's been a whole change of personnel 
is that quite a lot of people have been thrown out. And, of course, because the Equality and Human Rights Commission found against the Labour Party, and the Labour Party had no choice but to act. But all this was unbelievably slow. The other thing that's important, which is relevant and perhaps also something we should talk about, is that all the anti-Semitism did not play well at the general election. There were quite a lot of cynics who said that Corbyn was going for the Muslim vote by going for the anti-Semitism and the anti-Israel stuff. But actually what he didn't realize is that other minorities aren't stupid and they can see that they too might well be targeted at some point. And in fact, I think one of the very few good things that's come as a result of all of this is the outreach of many Muslim organizations towards the Jewish community and have just said it's completely unacceptable. And um, very, very interesting, because there have been all sorts of issues about Bradford, as some of you all know, but actually Bradford has Muslims on its synagogue council. And so it's actually quite interesting about how that all plays out. And really important that on the doorstep, and they've, they've now got the, the sort of some of the responses they got to the canvassing, on the doorstep, people really didn't like the anti-Semitism. They probably hadn't ever met a Jew, but they just didn't like it. And it's one of the good things about Britain. It didn't play well. Last point, conflation of Zionist and Jew. Again, something that we need the authorities to help us deal with. But of course, Jeremy Corbyn didn't help that one either, because people might remember that there was um, this video that appeared of Jeremy um, in the summer of 2018. This all, the, the worst of this is 2018 to 2020, 2021. And Jeremy Corbyn accuses British Zionists, I quote, of having no sense of English irony. He was at the Palestine Return Center and he said, and I quote directly, British Zionists clearly have two problems. One is that they don't want to study history. And secondly, having lived in this country for a very long time, probably all their lives, they don't understand English irony either. Now, of course, it makes no sense to say British Zionists have no sense of irony. Zionism is a political and or religious belief. But when Corbyn said, however long they have, they, of course, have lived here, he means Jews. And that's, of course, what led to the outrage. He used Zionists as a term to demonize Jews, claiming in, that he's in no way personally anti-Semitic. Yet, describing Zionists, for which read Jews, as having no sense of irony, and therefore unlike everyone else, suggests that they're not proper Brits, even if they were born here. They're other, foreign, it's othering, unable to share the uniquely British sense of humor. And that's why the elision of Zionist and Jew is so frightening on the left. It's very dangerous and horribly seductive for those who don't stop and think. So it's not surprising that quite a lot of people, Jews and non-Jews alike, were outraged by that particular comment. Jonathan Sachs, Lord Sachs, told the New Statesman that it was the most offensive statement made by a senior British politician since Enoch Powell's 1968 Rivers of Blood speech. I think he was wrong. I think there have been lots of really appalling things said since 1968. Uh, he said that it was divisive, divisive, hateful, and like Powell's speech, it undermines the existence of an entire group of British citizens by de depicting them as essentially alien. He continued by saying that Corbyn, um, by implying that however long they have lived here, Jews are not fully British, is using the language of classic pre-war European anti-Semitism, which ties back, of course, to Harry's experience. And then he, he said that, you know, Jews have been in Britain since 1656. I know of no other occasion in these 362 years when Jews, the majority of our community, are asking, is this country safe to bring up our children? Well, that's actually not true either. He was a very extreme reaction an understandably very extreme reaction. But of course, with things like the uh, Mosley, we're seeing it now a bit with Ridley Road, but it wasn't as big, but with the Mosley stuff pre-war, with you know, Nazi sympathizers in Britain, and with some of the fuss about the Eastern European, Russian and Polish Jews coming here between 1881 and 1905, there were times when the established Jewish community actually wondered whether it was safe. And we also know, to our own shame, that some members of the Jewish community here campaigned for the 1905 Aliens Act to stop more Jews coming because they thought that that would keep them safer. So it's not true to say that. I really 
much prefer Jonathan Lynn, um, the co-writer of Yes Minister's Response. Some of you are nodding, so you know this. He said that the most appropriate response to the Labour leaders' denials of anti-Semitism came from Sir Humphrey Appleby, the programme's fictional Whitehall Mandarin. Never believe anything until it's been officially denied. And to that he added, I'm Jewish. Although I wrote Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister, Corbyn says I don't understand English irony. My co-writer, Tony Jay, was only half Jewish, so perhaps he half understood irony and was able to supply some. I do think laughing at it's quite a good idea. I could say a lot more. There's a huge amount to say here, and what's happened in the last couple of years, I think particularly taking 2018 to 2020, is deeply significant. Are the authorities going to go with the University of Essex or the University of Bristol? Which approach is going to become the approved and standard approach? What's the nation going to want? We don't have Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party anymore. Is Starmer going to be able to persuade his colleagues to turf out a load more people out of the Labour Party, which might not be all that good for them in terms of campaigning and numbers and money? Or will he have to give way to those who say, mm, it wasn't too bad? Are we going to have controls on social media? And if so, are the controls on social media going to be able to grapple with this without stopping all sorts of other kinds of free speech? And how do we feel about that? And lastly, with our race relations legislation, and with the Equality and Human Rights Commission coming out and saying that the Labour Party had broken the law, we clearly have some ways of dealing with this, if you like, politically and legally through our legal system. But is that enough? So I think that what we have to do as Jews and indeed as other people who are not Jewish but stand with us on this, is stand up and say, it is okay to criticize the actions of the State of Israel, not to deny its right to exist, but to criticize the actions of the State of Israel. But it all depends on the context and the tone of voice. So if somebody only criticizes Israel and is part of BDS, but doesn't criticize China over the Uyghurs, doesn't criticize Saudi over its treatment of women, doesn't cr criticize all sorts of countries over their treatment of foreign workers, doesn't criticize us over our treatment of asylum seekers and the possible suggestion that we push, should put the, push the boats out, back out to sea, then it is unacceptable. But if it's in the context of picking up on human rights abuses more generally, then it's okay to criticize the State of Israel. Now, that's a difficult position to hold, but I think it's the position we have to hold because I think we have to stand up and say, it is okay to criticize the state of Israel when it is legitimate to do so, context, but it is not okay to elide the state of Israel with all Jews. And it is not okay to, if you like, elide the term Zionist and Jew. We have to stand up and say that, and we have to find a lot of allies who aren't Jewish to join with us in saying that. And we then have to shout out loud and clear for regulation of what goes on in social media when it is violent and it targets either individuals or groups. I think it's very difficult to say we should target anything that is even remotely anti-Semitic or Islamophobic or misogynistic, well, there would be nothing left on social media, would there? Um, but, you know, it would be very difficult to say that you've got to do that. But where there is a real threat, I think it's probably going to have to be necessary to limit social media. But I think we have to be vigilant. I think we have to stand up and be counted. I think we have to find and work with our allies. And I think that it's going to be serious for the next few years. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, um, Rabbi Novaga, and um, just um, uh, there, there, you've, you've uh, introduced so much into the discussion, and I know there are some questions and some questions that are going to arrive from the community in here, 
and some on Zoom. I will actually start with the questions on Zoom, one from Victoria, uh, who asked uh, that, uh, unfortunately, the anti-Semitism in the Green Party is growing exponentially, largely driven by the younger members who are active on social media. What would you suggest about political action when there seem to be no welcome in place uh, or place in any of the political parties for Jews? Well, it's not true to say that there's no welcome in the political parties for Jews. So I would say to you that there's quite a strong welcome. I have to say I'm not a Tory, but there's quite a strong welcome for Jews in the Conservative Party. Uh, there's actually quite a strong welcome for Jews in the Labour Party under, under Keir Starmer. There's a strong welcome for Jews in my old party, the Liberal Democrats. They had a bad reputation for a bit, but that's been stamped out. Uh, and if I were Victoria, I think, is it Victoria Sharp? Uh, no, it's uh, Osborne, I think. Okay, anyway, uh, if I would say to Victoria, if she wants to be active in the Green Party, she needs to go and see the Greens' leaders and say, what are they going to do about it? That's, I mean, it's that, isn't it? It's a mixture of some kind of controls on social media and some actions by the leadership. I mean, it has made a huge difference in the Labour Party having Keir Starmer rather than Jeremy Corbyn. Um, you know, Boris Johnson, I may not agree with him on a whole lot of things, but nobody could really accuse him of anti-Semitism. Um, and I think you just have to, we have to talk to the leadership and we have, be, have to be prepared to say, you know, if you allow this to go on, we're going to say it loud and clear, and you won't like it. I mean, I don't think Jeremy Corbyn likes being called an effing anti-Semite. Gets it quite a lot, though. Okay, and the next one is from, actually from here, from uh, um, Anonymous, I don't know who. Uh, would social media be improved if it was not anonymous? Well, of course. I mean, that's one of the things. One of the things that regulation could do is get rid of the anonymity and force the people who run the platforms to keep a record, which is one of the things Facebook particularly has been very, very reluctant to do. And that's bizarre, because it's absolutely full of Jews who are running it, including some British Jews, some well-known British Jews. And you just sort of think, just, and, and Nick Clegg, who was leader of my old political party. I mean, you know, what is this? Um, it's very obvious. There's money to be made out of allowing the anonymity and allowing the hate to continue. But in some ways, the kind of hatred that is being, that percolates on social media, isn't very different from the sort of stuff that you would see in Der Stürmer in the 1930s in Germany. And they're denying that, but it's not very hard to prove it. You can just pick out the various things that have been said. And you know, what, the, the, the reason the mere one cartoon is relevant is because actually the mere one cartoon could have come out of Der Stürmer. So, of course, the, the, the platforms, the owners of the platforms, have to keep a record, and they have to keep it for a long time. I think that's one of the things. And the other thing is that you can't be anonymous. You can't even, if you like, be anonymous like, with a, a sort of code name, like you know, what you, how you put your review on TripAdvisor. And I think we're going to have to go down that path. And you know, do I really want to go down that path? Not really. Do I think we have to? Yeah. Um, next question is uh, also from Zoom by James Gill. How much do you think the growth and acceptance of casual anti-Semitism on the left and even parts of the centre-left have to do with an attempt on the left to redefine racism as prejudice plus power, uh, with the implication from the redefinition that Jews are so-called privileged minority and therefore don't stand to lose much in society from anti-Semitism. Exactly, so this is the, the intersectionality stuff. So, you know, basically we're white and privileged, so what have we got to lose? Well, actually, it isn't very long ago that um, quite a lot of our parents or grandparents had to flee, and quite a lot of them didn't succeed in fleeing and therefore were murdered. So it's very raw and very near the top of our consciousness, even if we are white and privileged. And yes, to some extent, as a community, compared with some other minority communities, we are uh, probably wealthier than some, but not wealthier than others. And nobody would say this about Islamophobia, where there is a section of the Muslim community particularly the Middle Eastern Muslim community that is in, in the UK for most of the summer, nobody would say that they 
are underprivileged or whatever, but people would say that uh, attacks on them and, uh, and people spitting at them, which is something I used to see. When I was at West London Synagogue, I used to go down the road past the Regent's Park Mosque. And one of the things that shook me more than anything was people spitting at Muslims going to prayer on a Friday. And it seems to me that one of the things you have to say is it doesn't matter whether you're privileged or whatever. If it's hate, it's hate. And it doesn't matter that you're white and privileged or green and privileged or, you know, whatever you are, hatred is hatred and needs to be called out. Yeah, another um, question this time is, it is from me, but I did put it on text, so that's okay. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's the, the comment you made about Sally Rooney and actually at the end comment where you made that that's, that's a small change um, or, or to that effect that, me as an Israeli, um, actually it is not a small matter because I, I grew up in Israel, um, I've read uh, translated literature, it's very much shaped who and what I am and I felt that I was a part of you know, a particular culture, a particular society and this boycott, and not, that's not the only one, it potentially is with others, somebody is actually selling, saying to me, you are not a part of us. We're not interested in you hearing what we have to say. That would apply if her other two books had not been translated into Hebrew. So this is a little, this is what I would call, you know, political grandstanding. Now, of course she shouldn't have done it, and of course it's wrong. And, you know, I'm, um, I've just finished being the chair of the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute in Israel, where we did a lot of translation of Arabic works into Hebrew, so that Israelis would, le would read what Arabs and particularly Palestinian Arabs are writing and thinking, because that's important too. I'm not in favor of any of this, Yuval, but all I'm saying is, compared with the other stuff that's going on, it's small change. And actually, what I thought was very interesting was the comment from the publisher, the, the, the would-be publisher, Modan. I said, yeah, got enough books here. And I thought that was really clever. I mean, I just think the best thing we can all do about that is, if you bought a new copy of her book, please do take it back to the bookshop unread because uh, I think that's quite an effective way of dealing with it. And the other thing is just to kind of ignore it, play it down. I think it's much better with this to play it down. There are bigger fish to fry. Okay. Uh, another question, uh, again, from Zoom. Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg is Jewish. Have you thought about asking him for a meeting? There must be a way... Uh, well, uh, there must be a way to leverage his Jewishness to bring about change on the platforms. Would that, would that. I think various people have tried who are a great deal more important and more connected than I am. But there's Nicola Mendelssohn, who is a Brit, who is at Facebook. She's European director of Facebook. Uh, there's Nick Clegg. I've certainly talked to Nick about it. Um, they don't want to give way because there's money here. And I think, you know, one of the things about that we have to accept is that they're very, very reluctant to give way voluntarily. There will have to be legislation. Yeah. He's, not, he's not going to shift. He doesn't give a stuff. He doesn't care what's on his platform. He's just wanting to make money. And he's made enormous amounts of money. And what would be great would be to see him giving some money away for some causes to do with anti-racism. Okay, uh, the next one again from Zoom, um, uh, and this is re a reference to a, uh, a virtual hate attack on Manchester Reform Synagogue yeah. on Zoom, yeah. uh, on Erev Shabbat, and the question here um, is about uh, uh, whether we are in danger of overlooking far-right anti-Semitism, which is still very much there. Uh, I mean, I think we are in danger of overlooking far-right anti-Semitism. It is still, still very much there. Some people are saying that it's actually growing again. Uh, and that some of it, and one of the reasons I think that the relationship with the Muslim community is so critical for us, is that the stuff that is anti-Semitic on the far-right is also strongly Islamophobic. And there is real common cause to be made with the Muslim community in this country. And it's one of the things, actually, I suppose, that gave me greatest pleasure that when, you know, some of the worst of this all started was the, 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 the reaching out to us from so many Muslim organizations. I don't know how many of you 
follow somebody called um, Monawa Hussein. Do people know about Monawa Hussein? He's one of my great heroes. He is the imam of a big Slough mosque. He is the um, he teaches Islam. I think he may be stopping, but he's been teaching Islam at Eton. He is the new high sheriff of Oxfordshire, and he has been absolutely forthright in his condemnation. The Oxford Face Foundation, I mean, they have done really, really great work pulling everybody together. It's not alone, but he's a very good example of it coming absolutely directly from a local Muslim community. And, uh, you know, I think that what's going on on the far right will be targeted at, probably at Muslims more than at Jews, but it will be both of us and, uh, and Hindus and Sikhs. Um, anybody who isn't their view of proper white British. Um, so I think, yes, of course, we have to look at it and we have to look at the stuff again, the, the online. There's a lot of online targeting and online hate bombing uh, in the course of things. And, you know, all the security we have to put on our... If we're, if we're streaming something, all the security we have to put on that. Um, yeah, that's right. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Rabbi Nolberger. I'm aware of time, um, so I'm actually going to call Rabbi Margaret Jacobi to speak. Thank you. Can we give a book? Uh, just a... So thank you from all of us here, and particularly the organising committee, who I'm going to mention shortly. But Julia, as you know, Richard's already said, it was so right that you gave the lecture in memory of, of Dad. Um, we do have most recently memories of you visiting him in, in hospital, but he always looked on the positive side and I know he'd like to remember the more cheerful occasions like going to the opera with you and eating with you and just talking with you and um, he always enjoyed your company and it was such a joy for him. Of course we've also heard how sadly appropriate the subject was and as we knew you would you've given such a thoughtful, balanced and thought-provoking analysis. And I have to say, my son was taught by David Miller at Bristol, so I found your analysis of him particularly pertinent. But all of it is so relevant and so thoughtful and nuanced, which again is so sadly lacking today. It's so easy to have black and white arguments. And the nuance you brought also was so appropriate. So I want to thank you very much for coming today and talking to us. And I'd also like to thank all the people that were involved in organising today, and I do hope I won't miss out anybody, but a big thank you to Southgate Progressive Synagogue um, we haven't actually mentioned Dad's long association with the synagogue directly, although I know we're all aware of it, but of course he was rabbi for many years, and I think he always felt that it was his congregation, you know, in the sense that it was where he felt most at home, and that's why he chose to have the lecture in his memory from here, and looking round, I can see such dear friends of his. Um, so, thank you to you all. Yuval, thank you so much for organising the tech, keeping us on track with it, making sure it worked, and for um, looking at the questions on chat as well. I want to thank Andy Shaw and Leon Mendel and all the team who also helped with the tech, and for Liberal Judaism with their support and the use of Zoom, their Zoom facility. I'd also like to thank Barbara Martin and the House Committee who will entertain those of us who are here um, later on with hospitality. I'd like to thank the committee of Sue Jessel, Phyllis Friedman, Yuval, Michael Andvona, Mark Shaw 
and my brother Richard. And I hope I haven't missed anybody out. Um, and Pearl, of course, for welcoming us here as well. Thank you all, and thank you all for joining as well on Zoom. And, and thank you. Okay, this concludes the, the lecture. Well, I wanted to say thank you for everybody who joined us on Zoom and Facebook and uh, YouTube and all other channels. Uh, hopefully we'll see you at the next Rabbi Harry Jacobi Memorial Lecture. <laughs>